Hello everyone. My name is Matthew Marino and I'm the Director of Ergonomics and Human Factors with HeroWare. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. I hope you are all safe and healthy and that we can gather together in person very soon. My work at HeroWare is focused on helping people be successful with our exosuits. Part of this involves helping them learn to fit and adjust them. Exoskeleton technology must fit properly to be safe, reliable, and effective. Exoskeletons are very new to most people. Many of our users have never worn one. And while some are able to fit and adjust our exosuits themselves without training and practice, others need time to learn how to do it well. Over the past five years, I've been observing and assisting many different types of professionals fit and adjust all different kinds of exoskeletons and I'm convinced that fitting these devices is a skillful art. I've seen some people fit exos very well, and I've had to intervene in some cases where the fit was scary. There are many factors that play a role in user acceptance and adoption of exoskeleton technology, but one of the most basic things that we can control is the fit. Yet few practical resources or courses on fitting are available beyond user manuals and the occasional how-to videos. In this presentation, I will discuss why a good exoskeleton fit is so important, some recent research in this area, why fitting exoskeletons is a skillful art, and how to achieve a good fit for every user. The presentation will be geared more towards occupational exoskeletons, but hopefully folks on the medical, military, and recreational sides of our growing industry can find something valuable to take away. For those of you that don't know me, I'd like to share some things about myself that might help you to better understand why I'm speaking with you today about the fit of exoskeletons. In addition to my role at HeroWare, I'm also a founding partner of the ASTM Exotechnology Center of Excellence and have been involved in the, in the development of exoskeleton standards since early 2017 when the ASTM F48 committee was created. I'm a practicing physical therapist, strength and conditioning coach, certified professional ergonomist, and wearable technology enthusiast. I learned about exoskeletons about nine years ago. I was researching technology to help my son, who has cerebral palsy, and who you can see here on the left. The more he can do for himself in this world, the better off he'll be, and the less help he'll need from his very caring little sister when I'm gone. With him and my PT patients, I have experienced fitting assistive technology including walkers, crutches, and canes for ambulation, wheelchairs, and seating systems, adaptive ADL and sports equipment, various orthotics, braces, and splints, and for a period of time in my career, I worked with amputees and prosthetics. I've also helped fit dozens of different exos on hundreds of different people, both industrial and medical devices, since I began working with exo technology years ago. I'm sharing this because I'd like to welcome you to my world. I'm a full-time parent and caregiver of a person with a neurological disability that will never go away, who needs technology like exoskeletons to help him to become independent and improve his quality of life. I help people heal and recover from injuries. I help people optimize their performance. I help people protect themselves from their environment, the hard work they do, and in many cases, from themselves. I also help people fit and use wearable and assistive technology, including Exos. Some, like the HeroWare Apex in the right image, are relatively easy and quick to fit on people, while others, like the TheraSuit, which you can see my son wearing here, are a bit more time consuming and challenging to work with. I take my work helping people very seriously, and let's face it, I'm not getting any younger. I already use exoskeletons for certain things that I do, like house projects and yard work, and to help lift my son on occasion. And while the future is uncertain, exos may one day help me climb mountains or hike in the woods on the weekends with my family. Now let's dive into this presentation, shall we? 
You're probably wondering what in the world this is and why I'm showing it to you. Do you see anything concerning in this image? This is the beginning of mild skin irritation on an EXO user's shoulder, and I'm showing it to you because it's an example of what can happen to the user when their EXO doesn't fit properly. If this wasn't caught early, it could have gotten much worse. Before joining HeroWare, I was an ergonomics consultant with Briotics Health. I was working on a back assist EXO testing project with a Fortune 50 company about three years ago. We were testing four different back assist EXOs with workers who spent their entire shift changing vehicle tires. These workers performed thousands of bends, squats, and lifts per day to do their various job tasks. Their work took a toll on their low backs, and we wanted to see if back assist EXOs might be a good solution because engineering solutions to reduce the bending, squatting, and lifting weren't feasible. At one point in the testing phase, we went to check in with the workers, and one of them reported some discomfort on his shoulders, which he felt was due to the EXO. We checked his skin, and sure enough, he was beginning to get irritated, so we captured this image. We checked the fit of the EXO when the worker was standing still, as well as in bending and squatting postures. Everything seemed to fit well, and he was comfortable in these positions. We then watched him performing his job tasks, and noticed that he had to reach across his body often, and when he did so, the shoulder straps from the EXO rubbed directly on this area in the image. The shoulder straps were too wide, stiff, and unforgiving for him, so each time he reached, the device rubbed. Despite seemingly good static fit, the dynamic fit of the device when the worker moved was a problem. Unfortunately, there were no adjustments that could be made to eliminate the issue, and we had to ask him to discontinue use of the device. We notified the EXO producer, and design improvements were subsequently made to address the issue, but it was too late. The worker was no longer willing to use that type of EXO. I'm sharing this story because this can happen to anyone. We need to be aware of how poor fit can cause harm. There are many people in workplaces around the world that are buying exoskeletons and fitting them on people. In many cases, these people have never worked with exoskeletons before. They are opening a box with a shiny new EXO inside, throwing away the user manual, grabbing the first worker they see, and taking a blind stab at fitting the device. I'm not exaggerating. I've seen this happen. It's not always pretty. I have been lucky to work with and learn from some excellent EXO fitters. At work on the left, Mr. Keith Ganura, ex-co-founder, CEO, CTO at Nooney, and one of the original developers of their chairless chair assisted me with a project and trained me on the subtleties of fitting this device back in 2017 during my time at Briotics Health. At work in the middle here, Mr. Terry Butler, president and CEO of Lean Steps Consulting, EXO expert, and one of the best people I know at fitting Levitate airframes assisted me with another project and trained me on how to fit this device also back in 2017. I'd like to thank them and Briotics Health for these images. When I watched them work with people, I could tell they had spent a significant amount of time fitting these devices on themselves and others. They could almost predict what people were feeling as they guided them through the fitting and adjustment process. They were able to fit these devices on various people of different sizes and shapes quickly and intuitively. One of the biggest things that I admired while working with them was how much they cared about the user. Before we send people out to work with exoskeletons, we need to do everything we can to make sure they will have a good experience. Why does ExoFit matter? The first reason that ExoFit matters is user safety. Exoskeletons should not create unacceptable trade-offs. The worker from the tire shop may have experienced a reduction in back strain, but he was developing skin irritation that could have resulted in blisters or worse if it continued. There are very few situations where this type of trade-off is acceptable. Exoskeletons that fit properly should not cause harm. Safety is always number one. In the recent Exoskeleton Producer Survey from the ASTM Exotechnology Center of Excellence, the majority of those who responded were in support of exosafety standards and even safety certifications. The F48 committee has been working on safety and ergonomic standards, so I was glad to see that producers support this effort. The second and third reasons fit matters are reliability and effectiveness. 
exoskeletons that are not fit properly might deliver support and assistance in an unpredictable or suboptimal way. If users don't feel consistent, predictable benefits, they won't continue to wear exoskeletons. The fourth reason that fit matters is user acceptance. Poor fit almost guarantees uncomfortable users, and uncomfortable users refuse to wear exoskeletons. This is what happened with the tire shop employee. The fifth reason fit matters is exo adoption. Unhappy exo users stop wearing them. Then they talk, text, and vent to each other, their friends, their family, and their social media networks. They tell other people about their bad experience. We can't afford to let poor fit contribute to the development of a bad reputation. All it takes is one exo user at a company to spoil the beliefs and intentions of others in the workplace. If this happens at enough companies, the word will get out, and the exoskeleton industry will be doing damage control instead of selling exoskeletons. We are all here today because we want to see exotechnology achieve widespread adoption, and this begins with well-fit exoskeletons. Fit weighs heavily on users' intention to wear exoskeletons and to not abandon them. There was a recent article about a passive back assist exoskeleton study with nurses who have very high rates of low back injuries. The results were mixed, and the article stated that a technology acceptance model for exoskeletons doesn't exist yet. This is not accurate. In Kevin Purcell's excellent U.S. Army Public Health Center document, a thorough technology acceptance model is proposed for exoskeletons. Kevin announced this model at ErgoX. In it, fit is an important contributor to a user's attitudes and beliefs about an exoskeleton, and ultimately the user's intention to use the device. The model considers how fit contributes to various contexts and factors that must be considered and includes questionnaires for performing EUI model-based assessments. When we look closely, we can see the complex relationships between external and internal factors related to user intent, individual, social, and task factors, including fit, lead to user perceptions, which the user converts into opinions and motivations which drive acceptance. The model considers static, dynamic, and cognitive fit, and how each contributes to perceived ease of use and ultimately intention to use exoskeletons. Static, dynamic, and cognitive fit are well explained in this 2020 research article which points to a need for a better understanding of how exos fit users. Static fit is all about alignment between the human and the exo in static positions. An example of this was making sure the exoskeleton fit the tire shop worker in standing, bending, and squatting postures which were common for his job. Dynamic fit is all about how well the human and exo move together. An example of this was watching the tire shop worker moving his body to perform his job tasks. If we hadn't done this assessment, we wouldn't have noticed his across body reaching, which was causing his skin irritation. Cognitive fit is all about how exoskeleton changes the way people feel, think, and act. An example of this was the mental load on the tire shop worker from having to think about his skin irritation while he was trying to do his job with the EXO, and how he consciously or subconsciously needed to change the way he moved or used his body as a result. The poor fit may have been a distraction from his tasks. If the distractions had been great enough that he failed to perform a thorough vehicle inspection, which then caused a problem for the vehicle driver, this could have had grave outcomes. This paper supports the importance of fit with statements like, quote, improper fit can lead to inefficiencies, such as decreased active range of motion of the user, as well as an increased likelihood of overexertion, fatigue, discomfort, and injury, as well as, quote, the impact of poor fit on mobility may also lead to deeper changes in motor plan selection as well as increased attention toward task completion, increasing overall physical and cognitive workload, and risking diminished operational performance. These three fit characteristics are interrelated. 
and they are closely related to user safety, exo-reliability and effectiveness, user acceptance, and adoption potential. So how can we measure fit to make sure it's good? For static fit, body scanning technology can be used to measure the dimensions of users and exoskeletons. This is great, but may not always be feasible. In practice, soft tape measures and questionnaires are more realistic, and ultimately, feedback from the user helps identify any needed adjustments. Here I am measuring an Apex user to identify the right size device based on certain anthropometric measurements. I consider gender, age, height, weight, waist size, chest circumference, thigh circumference, and torso length. I use these measurements to identify the modular components she needs. I then have her put on the exosuit and check for a good static fit, which in this image on the left is not very good. Her elastic bands are too loose and standing, which is going to delay the onset of support and assistance when she bends or lifts. To fix this problem, I simply adjusted the device to shorten the back, which took up the slack. I then had her check fit in bending and squatting postures before moving on to a dynamic fit assessment. Dynamic fit is near and dear to me as somebody who has spent decades evaluating, correcting, and enhancing human movement. This past August, Roger Bosselman and his colleagues at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. published this paper. The very first sentence in their abstract states, quote, proper exoskeleton fit to user impacts the safety of the human-robot interaction. Again, we see fit and safety tied together. They go on to talk about the lack of defined ways to measure exoskeleton fit on users. Their work used optical motion capture systems for capturing the positions and movements of artifacts mounted to both the exoskeleton and the user in order to determine if the exoskeleton and user maintained alignment throughout the activity being evaluated. They tested their approach on two different test apparatuses and one human subject. They built rigid artifacts to mount to the exo and the user to attempt to manage potential measurement error from skin and muscle movement. They also created CAD models to analyze the results of their testing. They concluded that the approach could be a potential fit measurement method, but that it had some limitations. Future studies are needed to figure out a better way to mount artifacts and markers on users, and to determine if a markerless approach is feasible. I'll point out that bringing multiple cameras into many environments, including most workplaces, to perform this type of assessments would not be possible. So this is likely to be a lab-based approach. It's also not clear if this approach would even apply to soft exosuits. With some work, this might develop into an approach for measuring dynamic fit. There are other ways to measure dynamic fit. The paper we touched on before by Dr. Sterling and colleagues points to, quote, isolated and task-specific range of motion, torque required to exert external force through a range of motion, functional task performance, relative motion between the human and the exosystem, metabolic consumption, which you can see me measuring here, and surface pressures at the interfaces between the human and equipment. On this slide, I'm performing a cardiometabolic analysis utilizing a combination of heart rate, VO2, VCO2, and near-infrared spectroscopy measures. I typically use this technology with my patients and coaching clients to identify cardiovascular, respiratory, and metabolic limitations. But I've also found it useful for testing exo-related metabolic impacts. Since this type of approach may be a good surrogate for measuring dynamic fit, it can be used in combination with other approaches. I'm not gonna get into all of the details, but I'll tell you that I'm lifting 35 pounds, 10 times per minute for five minutes. These demands match those of some industrial workers, particularly those who work at a high level of intensity and are at a higher risk for injury. I alternated between lifting without exo assistance in the left side of the slide, then with exo assistance on the right side of the slide, with one minute of standing rest between each lifting cycle using an ABABA -A -A protocol. Because the apex 
can be engaged and disengaged with a patent pending dual mode switch, I didn't need to remove the device during the tests. This was hard work, the type the Apex is designed for, and you can see I'm sweating profusely. During the first A and B cycles, the body is still reaching a steady state for the work required. So they've been removed from this data to focus on the final three A, no XO, B, XO, and A, no XO cycles. When the XO suit is engaged, heart rate in green, VO2 in blue, and VCO2 in orange are reduced because of the assistance of the device. We can also see that with the one minute recovery period indicated above the red arrows, I recovered more in that time period after using the exosuit. Here we can also see the reduction in total calories in purple while lifting with versus without the exosuit. Again, there is also better recovery over the red arrows following lifting cycles using the exosuit. Reductions in VO2, VCO2, and total calories while lifting with the exosuit indicate that it helps reduce overall metabolic cost. Here we see changes in muscle oxygenation in light green and total hemoglobin content in dark green for the right vastus lateralis muscle as measured with near-infrared spectroscopy. The muscle is using less oxygen when lifting with the exosuit's assistance which means it isn't working as hard. We also see evidence here that when the muscle works with the assistance of the exosuit, the muscle pump forces out less blood, leaving more blood available should the muscle need it. The combination of better delivery and less oxygen uptake when using the exosuit indicates that the device helps to sustain strength endurance at the muscle level. You may be wondering why I chose to use NEARS on the vastus lateralis when the Apex XO is a back assist device. There are a few reasons. One is that we already have very good back muscle EMG results demonstrating reductions in back muscle strain and fatigue while bending and lifting with our exosuit. So I didn't feel the need to focus this effort there. But in case you're wondering, I've used this approach on the back muscles while bending and lifting and I've found similar consistent evidence using NEARS that the low back muscles benefit from the exosuit. I was interested in measuring vastus lateralis because it connects directly to the ipsilateral gluteus maximus and contralateral latissimus dorsi via the back functional line, so it is part of a myofascial meridian involved in back, hip, and knee extension, among other things, and I've not seen any other published data on the impacts of back assist exos on the quad muscles, so I decided to study it myself. The quads are a large muscle group and a large consumer of energy while lifting. So I wanted to see if our XO lightened the load on them in addition to the back muscles, which it did. This is very important for fatigue reduction. One final thing I'd like to highlight from my metabolic testing before we get back to ExoFit is the improved metabolic efficiency when lifting with the exosuit engaged. Humans have plenty of stored energy in body fat, but a very limited supply of carbohydrate fuel on board to do work. Here we see greater utilization of fat and less utilization of carbohydrates as a fuel source for the work being performed when lifting with the exosuit engaged. This means that the user will be able to sustain their effort for a longer period of time without nutritional resupply of carbohydrate fuel sources. This is another indication that the exosuit helps sustain strength endurance while lifting. And like we saw before, there is less utilization of carbohydrates during recovery periods above the red arrows after using the exosuit, which preserves this fuel source for when the user really needs it and delays the onset of fatigue. With metabolic results like these last four slides, along with additional confirmations of static and dynamic fit, we have evidence that the exosuit is working well and that it fits the user. I hope this gives you a sense of some things to look at with metabolic testing if you decide to use it for understanding dynamic exo fit. Measuring cognitive fit is very complicated. Somatosensation, executive function, and motor action selection require skills and equipment to measure, 
everything from clinical neurological testing that might be done by doctors and therapists to go no go tests, response times, target acquisition, motor trajectories, accuracy, EMG, near infrared spectroscopy, eye tracking, and brain mapping approaches are all options, most of which need to be performed in controlled environments. The user's experience, like how long they've been using the EXO, must also be considered because experienced users are likely to have learned how to use the device, and their results for some of these tests will be different over time compared to when they were new users. More research is needed to understand this, and it's likely that we will find significant variation between individuals due to their cognitive characteristics and capabilities, which are all unique. There are other considerations like neurological changes due to aging, habits, lifestyle, and potential neurological injuries and disabilities. This brings me back to the importance of using practical measures, like questionnaires. As much as I love impressive scientific methods for quantifying exofit, I'm also a big fan of questionnaires. Users know best. Even with fancy science, the user will still need to make adjustments if they aren't comfortable. There are many ways to design questionnaires to assess the fit of exoskeletons. Here again, Kevin Purcell's U.S. Army Public Health Center document provides us with a solid foundation of evidence-based questions to ask. He's laid out, in a very easy-to-use way, 19 key questions that EXO users should always be asked, and many other core questions that can be added to the questionnaire depending on the goals. Here I've highlighted two questions related to fit. One is a key question, and the other is a core question related to usability. This document and its questionnaire should be available soon on the U.S. Army Public Health Center website. By now, you might be wondering how well today's EXOs fit their user populations. We do not really know the answer to this question for all devices in exoskeleton domains because there is not enough available sizing data. But there was this interesting paper published this year which began to investigate this. I'm a big believer in designing EXOs for all, but I also know how difficult this can be with the tremendous spectrum of user sizes, shapes, and capabilities. Some things I would like to highlight from this article are that one-size-fits-all exoskeletons are likely to have height and weight restrictions which exclude larger, heavier people, like the growing percentage of the population who are overweight or obese, as well as smaller, lighter people, like malnourished people and children, from using these devices. Some exoskeletons also require minimum levels of strength or health to use them, which excludes weaker or less healthy individuals who may really need the technology. The article also highlights the cost of exoskeletons, and how this excludes users who can't afford them from accessing potentially life-changing technology. If you can't afford it, it doesn't fit. What I liked very much about this paper was the information it provided on inclusive exoskeleton design considerations. This table highlights height and weight spectrums, correlated conditions like blindness, capability variations like strength, gender and sex considerations, cultural awareness, and inclusive design principles, which exoskeleton producers should be considering. It doesn't tell EXO designers exactly what to do, but it's a good start for designing technology to fit all people better. So why do I think fitting exoskeletons is a skillful art? Here's the definition of skill. Skills are not something that people are simply born with. Skills take practice to obtain and master. If you've seen the Netflix documentary, The Last Dance, you know that Michael Jordan wasn't born a superstar. He just wanted to win more than everyone, or perhaps he just wanted to lose less than everyone. So he practiced in an effective way to make sure that he could win. Here is the definition of art. No artist creates a masterpiece on their first attempt. It takes years of study and practice to develop the mental representations and mastery of the skills required to express one's creative imagination and generate art. Michelangelo didn't just wake up one day and paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. 
he had to first become a skilled artist. Fitting exoskeletons is a skill that takes time, training, and deliberate practice to master. Since exos are all very different in their design, no two exo users are the same, and no two exo fits will be the same, fitting exos requires the application of observation, study, experience, and practice in order to plan and execute a unique, often creative, artistic expression of this skill. We know that exoskeleton fit is very important. We know that fit is related to user safety, exo reliability and effectiveness, user acceptance and adoption potential. We covered static, dynamic and cognitive fit. We know that it's not always easy to fit everyone and that one size can't actually fit all users. Fitting exoskeletons well is a skillful art. At this point, I'd like to go over some practical exo fitting takeaways and provide you all with some things that you can put to use immediately if and when you're fitting exos on yourself and especially other users. The first thing we need to do is make sure that exo fitters and users are properly trained on how to fit and adjust their exoskeletons. Let's not assume people can figure it out for themselves. The closer exos get to fitting like clothing, which almost all people are familiar with, the more we can rely on users to figure out fitting by themselves. Training Apex exosuit users is something I spend a good amount of my time doing. Some people get it right away and hardly need any training. Others need a bit more support. For training these construction workers, I went out to the worksite and immediately put the apex on myself so that they could see it right from the start. I wanted to disarm them and help them feel comfortable with this new technology by showing them what to expect and sharing the training experience with them. I like to take a hear, see, and feel approach with training. I want people to hear what they need to know, see it, then feel it for themselves. These workers never had a moment where they couldn't see exactly what I was trying to tell them, so the hear and see aspects were always tied together. I introduced them to the Apex and gave them an overview of the device on me, and very quickly gave them their devices so we could go through everything else with them getting hands-on practice from the start. Construction can be a very macho industry and I knew that they wouldn't have anyone reliable to help when I left, so they were gonna need to be independent with the devices from day one. They learned how to assemble and disassemble the exosuits, don and doff them, fit and adjust them, engage and disengage them, clean, inspect, and store them, and they got to practice it all until they felt comfortable. Because of the importance, there was a major focus on practicing fit and adjustment which leads us to our next fitting strategy. Practice makes perfect. It's not enough to train people. They need to practice or they will forget everything they were supposed to learn in training. This is critical with wearable technology like EXOS. We can't have people going out into dangerous environments like industrial settings without first practicing how to fit, adjust, and use their EXOS. We also can't have people fitting EXOS on others without practicing this skill first. There are different types of practice. You can read many studies and books about them all, but the type of practice that gets the best results is deliberate practice. With learning to fit exoskeletons, people need to take the time that's needed to practice. This will be a different amount of time for different people. Begin with practicing on oneself and when that's mastered, practice on others if this is a part of your job. Many people think that by doing repetitions of something, they are practicing. So they daydream while they practice. This doesn't work. Practice requires focus. Professionals of anything get there with excellent coaching. People who are learning to fit exoskeletons should be practicing under an expert's supervision until they have proven their competency. Break up practice into manageable parts. This allows people to focus on specific tasks, and it allows them to identify areas that are more or less difficult for them. Once you know what parts of fitting the EXO are more challenging, spend time practicing these. 
we are only as good as our weakest links. Set goals for practice. When I began fitting people with the Apex, I set a goal to learn how to do this without actually touching the user or their EXO. I wanted to do this for a couple of reasons. The first is COVID-19. And in many cases, I'm working with people virtually. The second is because they need to learn to fit the device, so I need to coach them and not do it for them. Finally, use feedback in the moment to identify issues, correct them, and learn. Feedback loops are incredibly important and useful when learning any new skill. As I coach people who are learning to fit and use the Apex, I give them feedback as we go through the process so that they can learn what they are doing wrong and practice the right way to do things before they develop bad habits. This brings me to the next practical fitting strategy. Feedback loops are powerful teaching and learning tools. As a PT and coach, I can't do my job without them. Feedback provides the nervous system with the information it needs to identify mistakes, make corrections, learn, and improve. When fitting exoskeletons, people need to feel the fit. This is tactile feedback, and it helps the person learn how subtle changes and adjustments make the device feel and function differently. They can then take what they learn from these feedback loops and use them to dial in their own fit and begin to apply their skills with other people if that's a part of their job. When fitting others, having the personal experiences with fitting are valuable because it helps one predict what the user needs to achieve a better fit and how the user will respond to certain adjustments. It also helps the fitter know what types of questions to ask the user to get the feedback needed to help fit the EXO perfectly. This is where unstructured feedback can be extremely valuable and where we can leverage questionnaires. If EXO users are saying it doesn't fit, it isn't comfortable, it hurts, or it doesn't move with them, there's work to be done on fit. I'm also a really big fan of fit checks. This is the process of meeting with new users after an initial fitting to make sure their EXO still fits and performs well. This feedback loop can be gradually tapered down as fit is achieved and maintained and as users get more experience with adjusting devices themselves. Here is a case where I use technology to establish a feedback loop with a customer halfway across the world. Because of the time difference and this user's busy schedule, we were not able to schedule training, but he was able to practice fitting it on his own, making minor adjustments until he felt it was a good fit. We then exchanged emails where I asked him questions, and he sent me this video to review. With the video and his answers, I had the feedback loop that I needed to give him some fitting tips, like making sure his thigh sleeves were snug. Feedback loops include tactile feedback, unstructured feedback in questionnaires, images, videos, observations, and fit checks. These allow us to see things that users might not be able to see themselves, and optimize fit as early as possible before issues develop. Qualified fitters. I'm sure we can all agree that the people who fit users with exoskeletons should be qualified to do so. How do we know if they are? There are currently no certifications for doing this. There are so many people from all different walks of life getting into using exoskeletons as these devices make their way out into the world more and more, especially in the workplace. There are people out in the world right now fitting other people with exoskeletons who in many cases are not qualified to do so. This is risky. Without exo fitting certifications, exo producers and end users have a responsibility to figure out how to make sure that anyone fitting their exos is qualified. In the medical realm, people need to have licenses and or certifications to fit patients with prosthetics, orthotics, or other types of assistive technology. When these don't fit patients properly, there can be issues and lawsuits. What makes us think it's any different with exoskeletons? The bottom line is that exofitters should be able to prove they're competent, that they're going to keep people safe and not hurt anyone, and that they will do a good job. Healthcare providers who have the requisite skills, which make them good at fitting technology on people, 
like certified prosthetists, orthotists, therapists, and assistive technology professionals may be natural exo-fitters, or we may want to start thinking about certification. For those that might object to a fitting certification, I would just say that if they are good at fitting exos, they have nothing to worry about and they shouldn't have any problem passing a certification exam. Next on the list is disqualification. I realize this might sound odd. Why would we talk about disqualifying people during a presentation about fitting people? The reality is there are some people and some jobs that are not appropriate for exoskeletons. If it isn't a good fit, we need to tap the brakes, figure out if we've done all we can do, and if it's not working, we should move on to the next person. There will also be times when users wish to disqualify themselves and we need to be okay accepting this. Here is an example of a case when disqualification was necessary. Before I explain, I just want to say that I've fit this EXO well on dozens of people who've gone on to use it, and I'm not proposing that this device cannot be fit well on others. This worker, however, had a back injury from bending and lifting cakes from the racks in the background. She was trying to come back to work and was able to return with some modified duty restrictions from her doctor. During my time at Briotics Health, I had worked with her company to develop a program for using certain exoskeletons for certain return to work cases. We had a multidisciplinary team involved. Everyone had been trained on exos. Physicians were supportive and involved in the process. And there was a tremendous amount of communication with all stakeholders, including the worker. When we rounded on her case, she and the team decided to give this EXO a try to support her through the remaining return to work process, back to full duty. I was sent to deliver and fit the device, provide training, and support the worker with integrating it into her workday. Unfortunately, this worker had a body shape and movement patterns that didn't work well with this device. She had a large bust and abdomen, a smaller, narrow pelvis, and skinny thighs. We fit the device on her as best we could, but the chest plate caused discomfort. The rigid components running from the chest plate to the torque generators at the hips pressed into her abdomen in the widest possible settings. When she moved in certain ways, the thigh pads slipped off her thighs. And when she bent or squatted, the chest plate slid up her chest toward her neck, which rubbed on her skin. We worked hard and tried a variety of adjustments to make things more comfortable. But in the end, the worker and I agreed it wasn't a good fit. This is a perfect example of when disqualifying the candidate prevented somebody from using a device that just didn't fit her well, which was the right thing to do to keep her safe. Sometimes we just don't know who we are going to encounter out there and who are we going to have to fit. Like this guy. I was able to get a good fit for his upper body, but his thighs were too skinny, even for the apex. The last practical exo fitting strategy has to do with choosing the right exo design for the user and the job. There are many options out there for exoskeletons that can all achieve similar goals. In the industrial space, there are dozens of options for back and shoulder assist devices. End users and exo fitters need to make smart choices about what devices to try to fit on themselves and others. For the female lifting cakes, one device didn't work, but that doesn't mean others won't. If it was the chest plate and the rigid nature of the device that prevented it from being comfortable for her, there are other options that are soft, that don't have chest plates, and even one that has gender-specific cuts and was designed to fit both men and women equally well. End users and fitters should do their research, know what options are out there and the differences between them. They should know how to fit a variety of devices well if they need to work with multiple EXOs to be able to serve their users best. As we move into the future of exoskeletons, I believe we will begin to see more exoskeletons and exosuits that are modular in their design, and more devices that are soft, so they can fit and perform more like clothing. In my experience, this design approach makes comfortably fitting both men and women, and a large spectrum of different sizes and shapes much easier, so that we can truly achieve the vision of safe, reliable, and effective, exos for all. Here is my contact info if you'd like to get in touch with me. Thank you very much for your attention.